God has brought each one of us to the place that we are here today. There's no denying that the sovereign Lord of heaven saw fit to bring us together here as this local church at Hillside. We're his family, and we are family. Each one of us belongs to this body of Christ. And, you know, we've been through, as I mentioned, one of the hardest seasons we've ever seen. And uh, it's been difficult for individuals on many levels, for families on many levels, and also for churches. But here we are at the start of a new year. Can you believe it? 2022. And I used to remember when I was a a little guy wondering what it was going to be like in the far-off future in 1990. (laughs) Maybe you can identify. Maybe not. (laughs) But, uh, you know, the question arises, what will be in store for us? With all the signs of the times that are pointing towards fulfillment of the prophecies in Scripture long ago predicted in the Revelation. Is this going to be the year that the Lord returns? Um, We know that we are closer than ever to the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus than we've ever been before. When will all this take place? And the question begs, what should we do to prepare for His coming? Well, the question of the timing of the return of Christ has been asked in ages past. And the same question of the timing of the Lord's return was asked uh, during the dark times, we look back in history, during the dark times of Rome's tyrannical persecution of the believers of the early church. And during the first century, many Believers at that time were convinced that Nero was the Antichrist, as told in Revelation, and that the believers thought that uh, the fall of Jerusalem was straight out of the narrative of Revelation prior to the imminent return of Jesus. So that same question was asked during the time of the Crusades in the year 1213. Pope Innocent III was convinced that they were living at the end of times. And as such, he rallied Europe to launch a fifth crusade to capture Jerusalem and the rest of the Holy Land from the Islamic Empire. So Pope Innocent III, um, he thought that the Islamic Empire would usher in the second coming of Christ. And... um, As it turned, the end never came, and their armies were defeated. The same question was asked of believers during the, or by believers during the Dark Ages, where corruption was was rampant in the Roman Catholic Church. And there were some very prominent leaders in the church at that time that thought the present Pope was the Antichrist. During that time, In 1514, we see Martin Luther attending the church in Wittenberg, All Saints Church in Wittenberg, and nailing his 95 thesis to the wall or to the door of the church, signaling the start of the Protestant Reformation. They thought it was the coming of the end, right there. The same question was asked in the day they called Black Day over England. In, 18, in 1780, when the skies turned black and the sun was blocked out over London, the people panicked and they were convinced that the end had come and the apocalypse was upon them and that Revelation's seven-year tribulation had begun. As it turned out, the blackened skies were caused by a mixture of smoke in the atmosphere from forest fires burning in a distant place, combined with the smog of the industrial pollution of the the Industrial Revolution. Soon enough, the skies cleared, and things returned back to normal. The question of the timing of the Lord's return continues to be asked in the present day, in the present age. Consider, for example, 
the darkest days of the First World War in the trenches in France and Germany. Or the crazy dictator Adolf Hitler and his rampage plunging the world into a Second World War. Or think about the uncertainty that we lived with during the Cold War with the threat of nuclear annihilation. Y2K, if you remember back when it turned to 2000, was to be the beginning of the end. The latest, as we know it, is the 2020-21 COVID crisis. The same question is being asked today that has been asked in every major dark time that we've gone through in history. It's certainly true that in 2022, we are closer to the coming of the Lord than we were, say, in 2000 or 1970 or 1942 or 1918 or 1780 or 1512 or 1213 or 70 AD. The concerns we have today with the COVID being a catalyst for the coming of the Lord to set things straight is related to the very question that the disciples asked Jesus after he had been crucified and raised from the dead prior to his ascension into heaven. You see, the disciples wanted to see the kingdom of God come down in a certain way. And they were hoping that Jesus was going to proverbially kick the butt of the governments of their world and set up a political shop on the earth. They longed to see the victorious physical kingdom of the Lord established in Israel and extend to the ends of the world. But Jesus, being sovereign, wanted to explain to his disciples that the coming of the kingdom of God would not come in the way that they thought it would, but that they would not know exactly how and when things would come together either. So they didn't know the time, nor did they know how it was all going to unfold and when it was going to unfold. We read in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. Disciples are around Christ before he ascends into heaven. Then they gather around him and ask him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from his sight. Wow. Imagine, you're there. You're the disciples. Jesus has just risen from the dead. Hallelujah. He breathed on them and said, Here, receive the Holy Spirit. They saw salvation through the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. And now they're like, We're spiritually ready for you to go and kick butt. Yeah, that's what they were essentially asking. We want you to mow down the Romans. We want you to establish your kingdom of power over the face of the earth. And what do you say? It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. The original disciples, impatient creatures as they were, longed for the kingdom of God to be established in a very physical way, right then and there. They wanted it now. But Jesus directed them to a different focus. He told them that the Father had plans. And it wasn't for them to know the times and dates that the Father had set by his own authority. He didn't say that the Father wasn't going to, that Jesus wasn't going to set things straight in the physical, in the future. He didn't say that. He just said they wouldn't know when it was going to take place. Jesus then directs them from focusing on their own ideas on times and seasons and how things are going to unfold to focus on the calling that God had given to them. Jesus was sending them as witnesses into Jerusalem, 
into Judea, into Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. The question of the timing of the Lord's return, my friends, ought not dominate the bulk of our energies. Recently, there has been the same sort of interest the disciples had in the establishment of the physical kingdom of God here and now. The focus on the unveiling, unfolding of prophecy has become an all-consuming pastime for so many believers. Now, I'm not saying that focusing on prophecy is wrong. I'm not saying that at all. However, discussions on prophecy have become an unbalanced focus at the expense of other crucial doctrines and things that God wants to do in His church. And many people have drifted away to an unhealthy balance. This is what happens when we get wrapped up in the present and our eyes off of what God is trying to do to prepare for the future. Our Heavenly Father wants us to be encouraged by the times and the seasons and the fulfillments of prophecies as they unfold, knowing that His plan is sovereignly trustworthy. But prophetic focus was never meant to stimulate to the church to turn inward. God's intention was never to see us expending the majority of our energies digging philosophical or physical bunkers of self-preservation. It was never intended for that. Preparing for the upcoming end times, the judgments in this realm. This is where we've seen over the years, sadly, we've seen the development of end time cults and communities that focus specifically on this at the expense of being involved in their society and their world. They withdraw into communes and bury themselves away from the trouble that inevitably will come as prophesied in Scripture. Prophecy wasn't meant to be taken this way. It was to encourage us to be mindful of eternal things. That's what prophecy unfolding was meant to do, to be mindful of things that are eternal in nature and that God is in control of all things and will bring all things to culmination in accordance with His good will. The warnings of end-time prophecy are meant to encourage the saints that the time is short and there, there is much work to be done for the glory of God and His kingdom here and now. The warnings also speak to those who are not yet believers to help them to see that they are lost without God's intervention. God loves all people and He invites people to recognize Him for who He is to understand what he has done to save them and to come to enjoy a restored relationship to him if they would only bow their knee, the knee of their heart, the knee of their spirit to him. When we ask God if the time is at hand for him to deal with all the wickedness that we see in this world, Jesus' answer to us today is the same as when he spoke to his disciples. It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by His own authority. Only our Heavenly Father knows the answer to the question of the timing of the Lord's coming. The Scriptures are very clear on this, but sometimes we forget. The question of the timing of the Lord's return ought to, rather than cause us to turn inward, to encourage us to be about our master's business. The same focus that the disciples were originally given is what the Lord wants us to focus our energies on in the year 2022. In Luke 19.10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And Jesus moved in the power of the Holy Spirit 
When we saw him baptized, remember, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Jesus worked his ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we have been given the same Holy Spirit to empower us to be his witnesses. And like the original disciples, we are his witnesses to the ends of the earth and a witness not only in word, but in the way we carry ourselves in this world. What does God consider as pure religion? To rescue orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And it's garbage, right? The same Holy Spirit that was with Christ in his ministry has been given unto us. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And we must be about our master's business with every resource that he has given to us. Our strength comes from the sovereign Lord and our prayer needs to be the same prayer that the Lord taught his original disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We need to understand and believe that our Heavenly Father knows the times and the seasons and the promises that he has made. And he will fulfill them when it is the right time. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. God will take care of us. He will take care of tomorrow. Jesus promises his children that he will never leave us to fend for ourselves and he will never forsake us. Hebrews 13, 6 to 9a instructs us with wisdom for living in this new year. Hebrews 13, 6 to 9, the first part of it's not, uh, first verse 9. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. My friends, We need to let this truth sink into the very fabric of our being. Jesus Christ is unchanging. He's the rock on which we build our lives. He's the same today as he was yesterday with his disciples when the twelve walked with him. And he will be the same forever. We can depend upon him. He said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 5, 14 to 16, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a lamp, light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God your Father in heaven. (laughs) Wow. You're the light of the world. Church, in 2021, you're a lamp on a stand. We are a lamp on a stand collectively, but you as an individual are a lamp on a stand. You have the light. If you believe in Jesus Christ, he's your Savior, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that Jesus worked under, the power of is the spirit that lives in you. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the heavenly realms next to the Father is the same spirit that lives in you. It is a light unto this world. You're a light in this world. This takes us to where we left off in our study of the book of Mark, right? Mark 4, 21 to 25, where Jesus tells us about the parable of the lamp on the stand. He says, he said to them, Mark 4, 21 to 25. Do you bring a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. You, my friends, and and I, we're the light of the world. In 2022, what is the will of the Father? 
Not that we try and figure out what is only known to Him. His will is that we let our light shine in what we do. In the way that we treat other people. In the way that we live our lives in the community. Outside these walls and inside these walls. How will people know that we are followers of the one true living God? How will, we, how will they know? By the love that they observe, that we have one for another. We can't allow the bomb of the enemy to distract us from our calling. And what is our calling for 2021? To be a light and to love. To love our neighbor as ourself. Love does no harm to his neighbor. Love takes the neighbor who's beaten and broken down on the side of the road of life, that lifts him up onto your ride, that cleanses the wounds, that bandages the wounds, and takes care of them. We're called in 2022 to take care of people that are broken and battered and beaten, both outside of the walls and inside of the walls. That's the commission of Jesus. That's what being a light is all about. That's what the lamp on the stand is. We are not meant to live our lives for self or only select people that we choose to let in. The revolution that God calls us to is not to bring the kingdom of God by force to a world that has fallen, but to recognize that God's sovereignty is over the world and in his sovereignty, he has called us to be participators with him in the divine nature. He's, particip- he's called us to participate with him in making our life count for his kingdom by proclaiming the gospel, the good news about Jesus, both in what we say and in how we walk it out. And he's given us the provision and the power to do this. Your life is the Lord's if you believe. His Holy Spirit lives in you. You were purchased with the precious blood of Christ. His blood was shed so that you could live. His cross was actually to be your cross, but he gave up his life so that you could have true life in him, so that you could be reconciled to him when you were far off and in a distant land. He brought you close. The light of the example of Jesus is an example of the gentleness and the kindness and the attitudes of the Beatitudes that Jesus displayed while he was among us. The same Holy Spirit lives inside of his children. The Beatitudes are the Beatitudes of God, their attributes of the most holy God who walked among us. His light shone in the darkness. The darkness didn't comprehend it. is not that what it says in John? Although they, they saw the light, they didn't turn. But whoever did receive him, to them gave he the power to become the sons and daughters of God. He gives us this as a gift, a free gift. God's desire is that we let the Holy Spirit shine through us in a way that they may see our good works. It's not that we earn our salvation through our good works. There's no angel up there with a, with a computer going, yeah, it's one more for Clint. Oh, well, that's really bad. Subtract one. You know, It's, it's not like that. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. All of us are sinners, and we need the grace of God to restore us into right relationship with him, and he made the provision. He paid the price that we owed, a price that we could not pay, a debt that he did not owe. He paid the price so that you and I could be filled with the Spirit and be a lamp of light on the stand. This is beautiful. The gospel's message, 
of love and grace was meant to be disclosed through you to a world that most desperately needs it in this dark hour. Some have a bent to self-preservation, preserving our rights and our place in this world free from harassment. But true freedom is not found through self-preservation. True freedom has a focus that is not on me and what I think I need, what I want, what I deserve. God's calling us to let go of this way of thinking. Matthew 16, 24 to 27 illustrates the will of God for how we ought to carry ourselves. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and He will reward each person according to what they have done. In Mark 4, 24 to 25, our text continues. And Jesus says, as a follow-up to the parable of the lamp on the stand, consider carefully what you hear, He continued. With the measure you use it, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more, and whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Now Jesus is speaking about his people who are filled with the Spirit, being like a lamp on the stand. The purpose of the believer is to shine God's light into this dark world. He who has been illuminated with the light of heaven's glory will shine with ever-increasing brightness. Did you know that? When we walk in the Lord? There's an ever-increasing brightness as we approach our Lord in glory as we walk. And if there's not, we need to return to our first love. Paul shares this principle with the Corinthian believers in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. And he says, Now the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the glory of the Lord are being transformed into his image with intensifying glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Did you hear that? God wants to continue to shine through you in ever-increasing, ever-intensifying glory. Not so that it can draw attention to us, but we can point the way to him as a light, a lamp on a stand, to the ones that are in the darkness that can't see. Light is the truth of Jesus, but it will only provide illumination for those who pay attention and come with a deep desire for understanding. For those people out there, and there's so many of them, whose hearts are in love with the darkness, and they're hardened to the truth of God's word. When the light of truth shines upon them, they shrink back for fear that their sins will be exposed. And this is what it is meant by the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 3, 12 to 14, where he says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we indeed hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. Sin is deceitful. The light of Christ shines in us, and it's truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Holy Spirit is also known as the Spirit of Christ because the Trinity is one God. God's given us his Holy Spirit to help us on our journey and to shine through us and to help us and to bring us to illumination. The Word of God, if you try to read the Bible without the Holy Spirit's assistance, you flip through it and you go, "Uh, uh, this doesn't make any sense, I, I don't get it. But when the Holy Spirit touches your mind and opens your spirit 
to the words that are in the Bible. They literally jump off the page at you and they're life transformation. They're transforming. They're not merely words, but they're the very word of God in all of its glory. And it's so good. It's so good. Because when we have our darkest times, we come to the Lord and we call out to him for mercy. And he says, you know what? You've been through a lot and it's just time maybe for a green pasture and he just touches us. My brothers and sisters in the Lord, you are light bearers for the gospel. As we approach the year 2022, may we approach this year prayerfully and strategically. We've been given the Holy Spirit to be our portion and our strength. In his light, we are called to shine forth the glory of God through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The good news that he saves, delivers, and heals the broken. In his light, we're called to shine forth God's glory in how we carry ourselves. So let's ask the Lord today to help us to have the right focus and to trust him with all the rest that we don't understand, but the Father knows by his own authority. Keep our eyes set on him. Live in a way that pleases him. The people that we rub shoulders with, may they see the light of Jesus shining in us and say, what is it that is about you? You've changed. Or what is it that you have that I, I don't have? Take me to this living water that I see in you, this light. Help me to come to that place where I, too, can see. Because I'm blind right now and I don't know what's going on. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, you can do that. He's as close as the mention of his name and all of us are sinners in need of God's forgiveness. And we can't change ourselves because it's not in us to do it. But the Holy Spirit, when we submit to Him, the light is turned on and He changes us and transforms us into His image with ever-intensifying glory. Amen.